Let's roll. Let's roll. So, hello. Um, this is really meant to be a very informal like, conversation. So, as I was saying, the phrase is which phrase of the day. Um, I guess for, for, for everyone, including the recording, I'm Emily Mitchell. I'm the Assistant Library Director. Um, this is Morgan Bond. Your title has gotten really long. It's Resource Sharing, Electronic Resources and Systems Librarian. Yes. Um, and as I was saying long ago, we really just want to have a conversation, hello, with... Um, is that... Okay. <laughs> we're having a conversation with people who are actually like out in classrooms teaching students long courses um, about library instruction and where it's been and where it's going and what it needs to do to, to serve your needs. Um, so I thought it probably makes sense to go as briefly as I can over uh, what has been happening with libraries, library instruction. Um, so rewinding really far back, um, in the 1970s, <laughs> the library instruction uh, sort of set up as I think we all knew it until this spring came into being at Susan Oswego. Um, at that time, there were more than 20 librarians involved in library instruction. Um, and it was really the, the format that I think people got got used to because it was going on for 50 plus years. Yeah. Am I doing that math right? I think so, yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Um, right. Which is great. Um, but things have changed a little bit since the 1970s. Um, when I first came on board at Espigo in 2013, we were down to 16 librarians and that felt pretty good at the time. So yeah. We here quite yet. When I came in, there were about 13. Yeah. So. Uh, and it was manageable. Like, technology has made things much better in libraries. 70s. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> let's not go back to the 70s. So, we were down to about six. Started in 2015. Down about, you were thinking 13. When I think you about 13. Years later. Um, we are currently at eight librarians and have been for a number of years. I was away for part of this year. So I think we got down to like six or seven at one point. So we're growing. Um, <laughs> so it's been kind of rough with staffing and trying to support this instruction program that was born in a time when there were 20 or more librarians able to do this. So great. Um, so this spring, we tried to look for alternative solutions. Um, and what we went to this spring, instead of teaching a, a one-off class session for any instructor who asked, we taught uh, one-off sessions only for English 102 classes. And then we had a series of library workshops that were not tied to specific classes that happened at regularly scheduled times. We did some of them in person, we did some of them online, we recorded them. We offered proof of attendance at the ones in person so that, you know, it would be possible to assign attendance and get some formal proof that someone had come. Um, and if you wanted proof that someone had attended virtually, um, we had like sign-in sheets and an email. If you wanted that someone had watched a recording because they were not able to meet one of the scheduled times, um, we had quizzes that the student could take and it would email the results of the quiz to the instructor. Um, we kept English 102, we kept doing instruction for them and only them because that is the place that librarians have the broadest reach across the student body. So we reach students in English 102 and I think it's about 60 to 75% of students at Oswego take English 102 during their careers here. Um, so we reach them at that like key moment in their college experience. It's often their first research paper at the college level. Like they need support there in order to be successful and like, you know, let's not make them super stressed out. Let's support their well-being. Let's 
support retention, all that good stuff. Um, so we kept English 102 because that was our broadest reach. Um, but the thing with English 102 is that if 60 to 75% of students take it, if you flip that around, then 25 to 40% of students don't. Um, and the way the one-shot instructions were working uh, before this spring, you know, there were students that we might see every semester, and there were students we might not see ever again after English 102, and there were those up to 40% of students we may not have seen even in English 102. And so it was just very hard to say what, what our reach with students or our impact even was. And in order to achieve that, we were putting this very unpredictable heavy load on our librarians who Morgan has like three job titles right now because they're so short staffed, um, which really meant that people were stressed out, overworked, um, um, and, and like we couldn't do anything else to support student information literacy because all of our eggs were in this one basket, right? All we could do was instruction because we didn't have time or bandwidth to do anything else. And that, of course, isn't even reaching 40% of the students. So that's why we were questioning it. That's why we switched to the model we did this spring. And the model this spring, I think we can say pretty conclusively, was a failure. Um, yeah, attendance was pretty low. I think my record high was two. <laughs> all of these workshops where not a single student would show up. Um, two was pretty good. Against that, we had one workshop more closely tied to um, what Com210 had been doing. And the instructors told all of the students from all of the sections to go at this one particular time. So we had gotten already at that point used to like, if you get two or three students, you're doing well. And then all of a sudden, there were 50 plus students in the room. <laughs> and that was a problem. But that was the only time that ever happened. And all the rest of them were much more likely to fit. Um, we did have some students turning in the online quiz as proof of attendance. But what I learned from looking at those stats. It's what the students turning in that proof of attendance had not actually watched video. They just took the quiz and I need to go back and actually score this. But a lot of them did not do so well on that quiz. So if they would be turning in this proof of attendance where basically they got half or more of the questions wrong. And I think when you looked at the stats for the Panopto recordings, even if students did look at it, if you looked at how long they watched it, it was like, a couple of minutes and that was it. Right. <laughs> so this clearly was not a successful model of library instruction. And it's not something we're going to repeat because like, there is no reason to repeat that. So what we have to figure out is what comes next. Um, and we were really hoping that this session could be um, us talking to y'all about what, what you need, um, how things have been going for you, um, all of that good stuff. And yeah, I think that's my whole introduction. Have I left anything out? I don't think so. Okay. Um, do we have anyone online or no? It looks like just people in the room. Cool. So we can do the poll and just kind of see where that leads. It's a really short poll. Um, there's eight questions total. We could just talk about it. I feel like that might be better if we have no one online. Sure. I can just do away with the poll then. Although I don't remember what the questions are, so you may need to put the question. Yeah, I can just put it on and we can flip through it if we don't want to. Beautiful. Um, also, I feel like I'm going to share it just for the... Oh, yeah, Ooh, for the yeah. map. Okay. Um, I know Alana. I'm sorry, I don't think I know your name. Do you want to know your name? Alex. Alex. It's good to meet you or meet you again. I'm really bad at names. I apologize. Jessica. Hello. No, it might be. So 
Yeah, we figured we would start off just asking simple things like, have you had library instruction in classes before? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, I've got a yes. Yes. And yes. I haven't, but I wanted to. I just didn't have a schedule. Oh, okay. And that was before this spring, or that was this spring? Sorry. Um, when you wanted to, but didn't know how to schedule it, was that before? <laughs> So yeah, we can discuss that at the end, or do we want to stop now? Discuss scheduling. It's hard so to it's... discuss scheduling when <laughs> I don't know what the future is. This yeah. is the problem. I mean, in the past, you could always email one of the liaison teams, um, and then we kind of filter it out to whoever is going to handle that class. But it is good for us to know that we need to make it really obvious. <laughs> and I think I went on the library website to do it. Mm -hmm. Yep, there is a form you can submit the there form, too. Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, I have relationships with a lot of the folks that I've worked with in the past. So they just email me and say, hey, I want a session this date, this time, that kind of Which thing. Which is great when you have a liaison who's been in your department for quite a while, but yeah. becomes a problem if you have departments that shift and sleep or people come and go in the library. Yeah. All right. What's our next? I don't know if I can advance now. There we go. Right. So I don't think we need that one. Okay. Um, why did you want library instruction? What do you... What do you hope that your students will get out of the class or, or other things that you want from it? We were doing these are plans. So I had a session where I devoted one class that might be with them. And um, where we didn't have staff, it was just me. But ideally, it would be library staff. And then we went over and had to do searches. And then basically, the entire class doing the searches and I was helping. Because doing the indicator geography is a pretty critical skill for developing research. and. Uh, even though they've gone to the library, they don't have any idea how to do actual searches or academic searches or searches that aren't for reliable sources, much less have a like cabinet in them or do keywords. So, so um, <clears throat> it was better to come here because they never use it here. It's a requirement, it's part of the class. And they all have their computers up, and then I can go from person to person and intercede after they spent the first half of the class hearing about how to do it. Do it. And by the end, they would at least have two resources and have some idea of how to search. So that's why. So we build in the class. And you say that ideally a librarian would do it. But if you had someone who's like a more recent librarian, I think it might be better at actually talking how to leverage the keyboard searches that you have that are effective. You know, some tips and tricks with your like running into problems and like maybe how to use some of the database sources effectively and how to download. References, reference links, and things like that. Just really basic skills and tips and tricks when you're like really bad at making keywords. So I have tips and tricks, and I'm giving you a but it's nice to hear how we're like different authorities. So the value add then is that it is that different authority that you're using to support Yeah, and also bringing them physically here where they all have computer stations or able to do searches. Well, I'm going around helping them alone is a good thing to have. The fact that you have this classroom. As a research, we don't have labs that you can check out like that, where you know, and so they're right here in the library. So I'm hoping to get it because the social thing too, right? So if you want people to come to the library, you've got to like make sure that they practice that with each other and doing the things you want them to do in the library. So it was also an anthropological exercise in like teaching people in this space and actually having them like practice doing the kind of things they want them to do on their own, and knowing that there are books out there and like. Journal the things that they can physically touch and browse, not just online, and like not be a wicked. Yeah. <clears throat> and then they can search with things that don't necessarily have anthropology journals if they're searching for data, because that's a different search. You know, psychiatry study that didn't actually look at culture or like use culture as a category rather than an actual research question. 
that might be a place where you're looking at those journals. So you're not going to just look at it. You know what I mean? There's some, anyway, it was part of the culture you to be using the library effectively too. Mm -hmm. And since they're required to be the class, I would have 13, 14, 19 people. Such a semester. I bet a lot of the research classes would do that. They were able to use the space, they would come in. You, you're actually you. like they, they can, and right. I mean, it's tricky. It can. Yeah, I mean, this room seems to be checked out a lot, right? So I'm assuming people are using that. And when we did the minority meeting, it was a networking thing. We had people bring their stuff and we met here, we talked about that. <laughs> it's not just the class. I've had at least two agreements each year. Well, in the last case. Super either of you then, yes. It's yeah, I've done here. it. I've done it both ways. I've mm -hmm. had um in the past with Michelle Fish and Clazars for health promotion wellness. Um, I would always have my intro to health promotion wellness. We they always have a health research paper. So similarly um annotated that they have these those types of things. Um and also really having them understand how to search, how to use the library, those types of things, and also just EPA formatting and citations, which will be really well with that. Um, and I would always give her the assignment, um, and she would use the assignment and how to kind of go through those steps for the students. So it was kind of like breaking it down for them at the smaller level, trying to figure it away before they got to the kind of the writing of it. Um, and then on the other end of things, I um, reserve this classroom for one of my upper division level classes when we were running SPSS analysis um, so that each uh, student had, you know, a computer and I would walk through certain steps, you know, up front and then they would work in their groups on analyzing the data that they collect and so forth. So, um, just following, trying to follow up on kind of the same thing. Um, so, for you, what, what is the value add to the librarian teaching it versus teaching it, I guess? Um, the, the again, just is. similar, being able to be, well, I guess being here one in the library, but also I think having, hearing it from someone else who's an expert in kind of all things here, right? And being able to kind of be, it is our department's resource person, right? So having them be able to have that connection, having a person, that they know who to come to, where to go when they come here. Um, I think that's the value add too. And also understanding, you know, I can come here and use these things and I have this person that's knowledgeable about my assignment. I think that's going to be the value add for me with that. So. Okay. And when you were similar or do you have different reasons? Oh, no. Very similar. Um, so for M280, there's uh, two writing assignments uh, where I usually make them respond to a prompt. Um, and I say, I it's, it's a very short to say, but I have them um, you know, use five to 10 sources. And usually on those assignments, the biggest source of points lost is because of number one, improper citation. And they cite improperly because they don't know how to look at sources. And like so many of them, uh, despite the fact that I tell them not to cite from like, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, Wikipedia, um, a couple of times they've, they've asked me specifically, oh, can I cite things from the lecture? I'm like, yes, but I prefer you not because there are actual sources that have much more information than what I'm presenting to you. Um, you know, I, I try not to get like frustrated with them just because they don't know how to use like certain like reference saving software like Zotero. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But like sometimes I'll be talking to them about like how to find additional sources. And I say, like, oh, so um, you know, what did you put into Google Scholar? Google what? <laughs> um, you know, through the university, they have access to like so many of these like journals and publications, um, both in physical copies and online. And so the fact that they don't know how to use that resource to me is just heartbreaking. Um, so yes. <laughs> And so it's really just having like a, a second voice supporting what you all are already telling them about the importance of, of using library resources and researching these things and deciding these things. Yeah, and I think also when we're not in the classroom with them, that there's another person that they know, understands, mm -hmm. 
how do these things? There's other resources on campus other than just with professor in the classroom during this time. If they're working on the paper or working on the prompts, they can come here and there is other, you know, um, faculty and staff that, you know, understand, you know, these concepts and are experts in this and can help students. I think just knowing, like, what can I do with the library or, you know, what's here? I think a lot of the students don't have <laughs> just in general, you know, and that they can, you know, have, you know, other resources and help. I would definitely say I've seen similar when I've done classes. I usually send out like a survey beforehand and ask the students, like, where do you normally start your research? And the majority of them say Google. Yeah. And if I ask, you know, do you know what a database is? Have you ever used one? Most of them say no. Yeah, because for a lot of my students, they feel like it's like daunting to like see the database for a image, <laughs> you know, where any you know, kind of just teaching them how to go through the process. It is so easy as well. I think too, it's not really easy if you know how to. I think that from what Alana said is just like super true. Like they do not know how to manipulate a lot of them do not know how to manipulate keywords um, or to you just you know this neat little tips and tricks that you can do with the Boolean search, like you know, putting uh, using plus signs or minus signs or quotation marks um to uh, limit or expand your um, results. Um but yeah. Our next question. And I guess I'd just like follow up for, for both of you too. When you think of kind of the library, the value add, is that similar to how you view kind of what our experiences are too? Or are, is there other things that you are trying to kind of open and that like what are what we could use as right. well? Yeah. So I know the question that I'm asking. The broad question is, how can the library best support information literacy efforts across campus mm -hmm. or across the university? Mm -hmm. um, but also trying to separate out, I, I agree with everything everyone's saying, students don't know these things and we need to know these things. Um, but trying to separate out is the best way to teach them that for librarians to be called unpredictably into classrooms where one student has heard us talking about very similar things 10 times now, and another student has no idea what we're talking about because they've never been introduced to any of it. Um, so um, what I'm trying to get at is the like, So sort of, um, it is about the need, but there, there's like a content need, and then there's this additional need of like introducing students to the librarian. Um, and then, but, but with the content need, there's this additional question of like, does it have to be taught by a librarian? Do you feel able to teach students these things? Um, and why not? Mm -hmm. um, trying to, to pull out the, the critical things versus the things that maybe are nice but are less absolutely essential. You know, if that yeah. makes any sense. So, with it phrased that way, I would say I could definitely do that <laughs> on my own with, with the students. I think how you phrased it, like the two similar things. Content wise is something I can do. Um, but I think fostering that connection, like if there's still a way to make sure like students are able to have that connection with our um, VAs on. Yeah. yeah. And I know that the other thing that we think about too is like, we kind of live our lives immersed in these library resources, we're in them all the time. Whereas, depending on what you're doing, 
you may be less aware that this interface changed and now you would, you know, here to get this specific thing where oh, there's this one tool or oh, this database like doesn't do truncation anymore. I don't know. Or they've combined JSTOR and oh, yeah. JSTOR and Art Store all That's one. Like, yeah. Um, just to do the meaning of stuff. Put a clause and you can add more or not. And then you do that alone. And it's just not that they've never, literally never got it. Right. So like that, just that alone, like to really make the clause that people And I would say. That kind of worried me. <laughs> it's like, hold on. Glad to see that you started. We try to start early. It's just not about the time to get to the point. <clears throat> it just feels like they haven't done these right. I think they have. It's just a really hard process mm -hmm. to actually limit the user sources. And it's not, you know, it's hard like in such a remote where you were when you do that. And that's kind of a point that keeps going through my head is like, a lot of times in their classes, they might go over a topic multiple times. They might be introduced to the same thing multiple ways. When we see them, a lot of times it's one shot. So it's a balance of like, how much can we cram at them versus like, okay, what are the most important pieces and how much can they retain and use? And then to add to that, it's one probably 50 minute session. And mm -hmm. some of them have met in the library at six times. Them. Don't know what the library is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so I guess did the changes this spring impact how you all were teaching things? So if any of this like research and the information literacy, citations, all of that good stuff. For me personally, now about the changes, I just think in general, I'm spending more time <laughs> teaching or covering just these skills in general. It doesn't have anything to do with like, the changes that spring, but um, so more to do with the state of the world and the students as they have a chance to prepare against something really or even like we said, understanding just basic skills of searching or using books or <laughs> you know like and her yeah I really want to blow their mind and explain to them that there's a good chance you don't have to read the book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this book is a source you might just need one chapter a little yeah. oh. I feel like right during the pandemic, they got better at doing some of the teaching. Um, there were some libraries who were really helpful. They got a couple of books. Um, you know, I didn't even know where this book is. didn't actually go to the library. Um, so I think they got better at asking and like emailing people about that bit. And then they just completely dropped those skills in their fracture. Interesting. Yeah, it was really interesting. Like the, the best researches, researching actual sources happened in 2020, past year, and then 2021, and then get forced to. But then this time, this year, and then the last year, I had to be like, you know, because they were online, they were online all the time. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. it's but they were more, it was different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I got a lot of feedback. I worked with a lot of the same classes and just did Zoom sessions. And I know for me, I only saw them once and I mostly just saw black screens. So there was no interaction. I couldn't walk around and see their screens, but like, oh, try this instead, or oh, have you thought about using this word instead? about that and looked at our research help desk stats and questions took a nosedive. We were not getting asked questions during those worst years. We were, but not nearly as many. We did have more one-on-one -on -one appointments. I wonder if 
Interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't say it really changed for me too much, but I would say that even now, I don't feel like we get as many chat questions. Like I feel like that has dropped off oddly. Um, would you would you say that also? Well, you already were not um, acting to the brain, so I guess that the changes probably did not impact you in the spring. Uh, although, um, usually at the beginning of each class, I like do like morning announcements, videos, and I always um, advertise the library workshops. Okay. I do have a question, but it's coming up in the slide, so I'm going to hold on to it. Okay. <laughs> sure, and that was this. Uh, so, something you did recommend, but not require us. Next time, next time though, um, I'm probably going to be preparing. Definitely for the right ways workshops. <laughs> <laughs> right ways is more important. So, it's the only fall. But you're in the planning about splitting it in fact, every time you can But right now, it's like sort of mixed in the fall. Maybe more, more libraries. <laughs> maybe maybe after like four classes, <laughs> like, go at least once. In my dream semester long library class. You know, I can think for the information university. I would rather see the librarians teach a first year experience class than many of the staff. Of what? Because I think you, if that would be really important. So if you guys want to put a proposal, uh, I appreciate that. Be okay with that. Um, in terms of the, the seminars that are not going to be a fan or in terms of they have it, I think they have the time to be able to just like choose to go to course. We just think they're using Scotsons basically for one credit. Um, and the, the faculty are teaching them now, and they're probably going to be like, it's taking a more active role in curriculum because it's faculty that run the curriculum. And I think that if, since the first year experience is not something they've given up on and they want to do it throughout the disciplines, I did a class on pseudo archaeology, like, you know, like how do you tell fact and fiction? What are some of the big finds in archaeology? That was my class. But a key part of it's supposed to be information literacy and like using academic resources and being trained in them. I feel like you could do a class, or like you could do maybe half a class or something with part grade. You do that was more library focused than the the research is actually understanding how to use reliable sources rather than unreliable. I mean, I think that's something that's, especially with the super science stuff, like really prevalent. And um, it's not something they're seeing. It's already a if it implies like foster fiction, I mean, that's what they are, you know. It's a lot of the same thing. It's really hard for them to do all the research, and this is the stuff out there. Mm -hmm. So, it's sort of like that's a really key part of the information literacy. And like libraries, at least, I mean, what you guys are is the regulated stuff on the internet, stuff that's actually verified, the stuff that's actually true. Whereas, you know, everything else that we the internet is not. And the fact that they don't distinguish between the two is partly because to actually have vetted stuff that's organized, right? Mm -hmm. There's some barriers to getting it. But they can just do really cool stuff like find all kinds of lies right away. So I think that's the they know how to search, they just don't have to tell. Mm -hmm. they, they know how to find something, but they don't know how to find true things. Best things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I could see people doing anything like that. It's never useful. But you guys, I mean, if you have staffing issues, like all of them do, 
that's going to be a problem. But maybe a partnership, right? Interesting. Let's see what happens. That, that I can see you do. Like, maybe you can help out people by doing the little section within a booster experience course. You know, like I can see that being a partnership with people. Because then we were supposed to be doing that. Like, we're supposed to be getting people to use parts of the campus in the booster. Because I thought that part of the pedagogy is you're supposed to be like, Doing stuff on campus. Like it could be going to an event, it could be going to like Port Ontario, it could be like, you know, why not have that? You could have a big band. And they get every class of information over C flow and sign up for this. I realize I'm giving those things. It might be kind of cool though, because like that's really the thing. Like finding sources that are wise. Like <laughs> I feel like that was a really big thing. It was a big thing in class. Like, you know, how do you know what you're reading is a lie? And like, you know, that. Yeah. Part of, um, because I give an entire like mini lecture on like, the publication process, process in 280. Yeah. Um, part of this is number one, so they know how scientific papers have been written. And the other part is so that they're made aware that, you know, not every journal out there has the most stringent. Uh, oh, yeah. So pay to play. Yeah. <laughs> so I also tell them about, about, you know, predatory journal, pay to play. Um, so I think, yeah. I, yeah. As it's assuming already that they can tell a journal article from. Oh, yeah. It's a different Yeah. Technology yeah. has been wonderful things for libraries, but I. The thing it has not done us any favors with is like how do you tell a book from a journal article from a newspaper article from some random, like someone wrote this? randomly and it went through no review process and it's yeah it doesn't help in the databases put things in oddly like that one database that has all the book chapters and its articles yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's wrong with that it's just the way it loaded it, it's still accessible it's fine it's really not <laughs> So for those of you, um, whether you did or didn't recommend that students attend a workshop, why did you or why didn't you? You were recommending but not requiring um, just because it didn't feel like you needed to require it in class or other reasons? Well, I didn't know if I good or should, um, mostly because, you know, student schedules being what they are, so I didn't want to, like, mandate they go to one, um, just to, you know, not know that there are students who, like, work and they can uh, go to one particular workshop. Um, but I did highly recommend them specifically because, like, you know, the skill that are, the skills that are uh, taught with these workshops are, like, super, super desirable, whether or not a student is going to to you know, pursue a higher education, you know, getting uh, going to get a master's uh, graduate degree, um, or whether actually one of the ways that I kind of marketed it in the uh, announcements what were that you know even if you're just going into like business or whatever or you're going to join the workforce you're going to need to look up things, um, and you know what you put into a Google or Bing search bar and how you put it is really going to influence your results. And you know they will teach you how to get the best results with the well, uh, with surgeons, among other various systems. So scheduling definitely a concern for requiring um, the recordings. Then you ahead of us in knowing they would watch the recording or just I did not know there were recordings. Okay, would difference? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, similar to that. I mean, I've uh, recommended them before, even in even in things. Um, but um, requiring, I know, it's for the same reason. Just um, equity being equitable for all students, depending on some, you know, level of tolerance to back and work or have support, so things like that. So. Um, 
What about playing them in a class, like rather than coming to the library or e even bringing them to the library and then playing the recording of the session? Would that be something that would be helpful? Something I use is um, one of the research guides. I'll play those videos, or there's some for each field that are on the website that will link me get into that module. Like I'll, I have those in my online class modules they have to use, or when we get into that in face to face, I'll play those. So I do use those resources in that way. If you did play a video of a librarian in a class, though, like, do you think that would help students make the connection that hey, there's someone in the library who's not to, or not so much? Yeah, I mean, when Kate George came to talk to him for his students in the class, so there were a couple of students that had a class in contact with him. So if they make they see you the person maybe that would be more effective than they if it's a lot of you know, you might be changing. I think the fact that she physically showed up, I go, oh, I can actually talk to the person. Even though they have the you know the Grinch's website, nothing the fact that she, she showed up you know, went through the website basically to show them how to use it. I thought well, it was two students out of my class of 13 that made really the cast and seemed. Um, that made one or two very Yeah, we already kind of went over that one. Look like Freedom World Empire. Everyone has all the sources. So, um, sorry. Um, I would definitely, you know, require these kinds of like, you know, workshops, um, especially before uh, writing assignments. Um, so, possibly even double up because there are two papers in um, F280. Um, and well, especially for the uh, prospectus, because I also have a prospectus assignment in um, the advanced forensic course. Um, and they did pretty well in the write ups, but you know, there's always uh, ways that they can improve. And some of them had kind of trouble because I mandated that they had at least um, 10 to 15 sources for that paper, even though it was a larger, you know, research, but still. So, in the perfect world, there might be more than one library session. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that librarians write to like like to write articles about um, things like embedding a librarian into a class, which is maybe slightly less than to teaching, um, but like librarian who is like in your course shell and might show up multiple times and do all these things. Um, personally, I think that's wonderful and I'm absolutely not saying we will ever have the staff things, but in the perfect world, is that something that would be interesting or like that? No, <laughs> the sky's the limit. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I think something that is for this person is like, yeah, if there was like even a module, like a whole research module that a library can put together of like, Options of like this is how you should start process of searching citations before we get into like that would be really cool. That's kind of like collaborative, just like a module that could be placed into our bright spaces. That could be kind of cool too. Huh? Um, or even if there's like 
that person. <laughs> well, I'm ready to talk with you. Michelle, you can ask the questions. <laughs> It's true, but we might be able to make that challenge too. It's been the other mm -hmm. Because unless they know that it exists and they go to the website, oh, right. they're not going to use it. Yeah. So just like if the students are in that audience, like, oh, this isn't working, and there's a chat button. Yeah. Yeah. To our participant, um, <laughs> we are just wrapping things up, just talking about kind of a blue skies, uh, in the perfect world, what the kind of construction what does it look like? That's the last one, so. Yeah, that's the last one. one. Okay. Yes. So yeah, more libraries is kind of more fun. We get into the classes, we would actually have access to more journals. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't be getting rid of books. Um, and books ever. Well, no, I mean, like a lot of books that were on the list to get rid of were like seven books. You know, like they're <clears throat> like foundation books, comic John, stuff like that. Yeah, like we, my apartment's been systematically going through like, not this one, not that one. Which we appreciate. Um, right, right. And so he is like, um, yeah, I mean, you know, no one, but I mean, I understand that one of the resources, so we do not. You know, I like I said, first year experience. Of, a required class, you know, you know that class is. It'd be nice to have it integrated into the research process. And I don't actually do the same thing resources in terms of computer related research. Um, and I don't want to write a book for it, or like just empty citations, but but I think that's a good idea to have it in like the lower division classes. Like that part of the instruction to be built in. Because it, it, it takes a lot of training for an apprenticeship and a lot of to learn how to use these sources. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't really have most of the programs that you can run here because the limited staff aren't really that much. Um, and they can't be, and they can't. You know. So, And Thank you. Us. If you think of anything after the fact, feel free to email either one of us. Because totally. we're definitely going to be talking about this over the summer. <laughs> Inside the library over the summer, um, I'm sure there will be conversations about it, further conversations outside the library, because y'all need to know what's going on. Um, you want us as a resource, or you want to have us say something about what we're not using, or whatever you see to ask. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So we need Apple TV. Yeah. Yes, we use this one. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I think our partnerships across campus are very uneven. So there are departments that are like, why would I bring my class over? And then other departments are like, oh, we come over all the time. We definitely need the library. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Sorry, I'll